everyone, I'm Captain Logan. And I'm DC. And welcome, as always, to the vast and ominous comic vault. You are witnessing the first edition of Captain Logan's Top 5 Countdown. Every week now, I'm going to count down my top favorite comic books of the week. And before I do that, I'd like to allow you folks to partake in my and Jason's weekly comic book ritual. And we're going to try to do this for you every week at the beginning of the show. I have not yet read any of the books we got today. In fact, we just got back from the comic book shop. And what Jason and I always do as soon as we get back from the comic shop, and sometimes even into the car, is we go through all of the books that I got that week in my pile because Jason spends the time we're at the comic shop looking at the kids' books and looking around at statues and things. He doesn't see what we get, and so when we get in the car or when we get back home, he likes me to take him through all the books so that he can see what I picked up that week. Are you ready, Jason? Yeah. So we're going to do that for you right now. You're going to get to see all the books that I picked up this week, regardless of whether or not I talk about them uh, today. And I, as I do this, probably what will happen is that I'll give you a couple of up. Sometimes I'll mention a couple of things where I'm like, this didn't make my top five, but here's the thing I really wanted to mention about it. As I said in the comic vault I did last week on Batman and Robin, I don't want to uh, go do uh, full-blown, hour-long, hour-and-a-half-long shows anymore. I mean, I'd love to. I just don't have the time right now. So uh, instead of reviewing everything on my pull list, I'm going to give you my top five for the week and try to do it as early in the week as humanly possible so that I can tell you what I think uh, are the best books that came out th uh, that week, at least that I read, and what I think you might want to pick up the comics at the comic book store. Jason, here we go. First up, I picked up The Amazing Spider-Man. Amazing Spider-Man number nine. This is the beginning of Spider-Verse, and I've been really excited about this. Regardless of some of the issues that I have with that I have had with Dan Slot Spider-Man in the past, this is an event that I've been really kind of looking forward to seeing what happens with it and the Road to Spider-Verse stuff, the couple of issues of that I read I really kind of liked. Then I picked up Batman Eternal. Batman Eternal 31. I'm still reading uh, that book. And then I got... Um, You Failed the City Green Arrow. <laughs> you Failed the City? <laughs> Jason loves Arrow. Green Arrow number 36. Uh, I was not real happy with uh, Kreisberg's first outing on this. Kind of interested to see what the second issue is like. Uh, this is a book that I kind of am thinking about dropping, but I'm going to give it one more shot. Spider-Verse Team Up. Spider-Verse Team Up. Life After Logan. This is one of the uh, one-shots. I think this is a one-shot. I uh, put out right after uh, Death of Wolverine. Um, just grab that kind of on a whim just to see what that's like. <laughs> that's my face. Rocket Raccoon. Rocket Raccoon number five. With Groot. With Groot. Spawn. Spawn 248. Yeah, because you do spawn you. That's right, I did spawn you. You're right. We're two issues away from the big, giant, enormous landmark because Todd McFarlane sure likes making a big deal out of landmarks. 250, uh, which will see the return of Al Simmons. A lot of people are uh, really touting this up as a big, giant event. Naturally, uh, Todd McFarlane once again trying to get people excited about spawn again. Hopefully. Fingers crossed, the new creative team can bring some uh, new, in necessary energy and life into this book uh, because the last six years is a story that could have been told in about six issues. Uh, what do we got next? Tiny. Tiny Titans Return to the Treehouse. The last issue in Return of to the Treehouse. Superman. That that's that's a you behind his head. You tamed. Unchained. Unchained. Superman Unchained number nine. Tamed. I thought this series was over. I read issue eight and thought it was the end of it. So what do I know? Anyway, uh, Superman Unchained number nine. Uh, is that getting ten issues? Is that what's going on? A Axis. A Axis. Axis. Axis number four. Loving this event so far. Dead pools. Auto I didn't know about this, didn't notice this I, I, before I had been out of the comic shop for a, for a couple of weeks, and uh, there's a new miniseries written by Peter David called Deadpool's Art of War. Art is really interesting looking in this, and uh, it, it looks very uh, uh, Japanese-inspired, so I'm very interested to read this. Tooth and Claw. Tooth and Claw, a uh, new, new book from Kurt Busiek. 
And finally, I picked up uh, the trade for uh, Spider-Man The Death of Gwen Stacy. Uh, I don't know how recently this edition came out, uh, but it caught my eye because it's a uh, really cool looking McFarlane cover, and it's uh, this classic story in uh, beautiful uh, glossy pages and really pretty colors. So anyway, um, I'm going to go take a look at all my uh, single issues for this week. Obviously, this is not in the running for top five. I will put this on the wheel very, very soon and hopefully do a review of this sometime in the near future. So, uh, going to review my comic or going to look at my comics and then the top five countdown begins in just a moment. Number five. Rocket Raccoon number five by Scott Young and Jake Parker. A delightful, lightning-fast read with a simple but effective story in which Rocket tries to tell a group of alien Boy Scouts about his grand misadventures. When Groot steps in, who is sitting uncomfortably close to that campfire, I might add, we're treated to a hilarious 20-page tale enthusiastically narrated by Groot. Of course, every character in his version of events says only those three words that can mean anything depending on inflection. I am Groot. And it's fun to try to decipher their meaning based on context. Context. The bulk of the comic essentially relies only on artwork to tell a new take on the age-old greedy pirate following a treasure map story, with a fun twist at the end. The message, as it so often seems to be in Guardian stories, is that while these intergalactic rogues play tough and want everyone to think that money is all that matters to them, deep down, they value each other's friendship more. It's wholly skippable, but a nice reminder of just how much emotion, humor, and even plot can be conveyed through sequential artwork, without solely relying on what people are saying, though Young certainly gets plenty of mileage out of deliberately putting I Am Groot in the mouths of people in all sorts of moods, be they awkward, panicked, nervous, or enraged. I sometimes wish this were an all-ages book because of its cartoon sensibilities and its sense of adventure. Some issues have included material inappropriate for children, and others, like this one, strike me as perfectly suitable for anyone. If you want a light, sometimes goofy read requiring no prior knowledge, pick up Rocket Raccoon this week. Number four, Amazing Spider-Man number nine by Dan Slott and Olivier Coppel. I definitely have my reservations and raised an eyebrow a few times reading this, but the official first issue of Spider-Verse is on my list this week because I can't lie and say I wasn't immensely entertained. It's zany, it's preposterous, it's fanficish, as I and plenty of other critics have called a lot of slot stuff, but it's really creative and fun fanfic. It's one of those stories I can enjoy for what it is, regardless of whether I think it should be an in-canon thing. I mean, we've got Spider-Crisis here. There's a lot that's suspiciously DC Infinite Earths, but to be fair, the whole of the Marvel Universe has been inching closer and closer to this sort of thing since Marvel now started. At the point that we're regularly mixing 616 with Ultimate and it's not even a newsworthy event anymore, all bets are kinda off. The setup is that in Earth 1, Morlin and a scary vampire-ish clan are starving and need the lifeblood of spider creatures, totems, to survive. So they've been going all over the multiple kidnapping Spider-Men, women, and Spider-whatever-else to feed on as delicacies. They remind me a little of creepy cults of cannibals I've seen in Buffy and Spawn and other horror things, secret high society organizations that act all civilized but barbarically serve sentient beings as their main course. So spider Ox started rounding up an army of Spideys throughout the multiverse to combat this threat, and some of them have finally made it to 616 to recruit our Spider-Man, who is, naturally, the most important of them, and the one Weaver, who I think is supposed to be the leader of the cult, has been saving for the end. I really resist all this great web of reality and spider destiny and totem stuff. GMS introduced some of that, a lot of people really didn't care for it, and I thought it had been all but retcon. And now it's back, and more ridiculous than ever. This isn't a continuity that revolves entirely around Spider-Man. It might be easier to swallow if it did. This destiny stuff makes characters' decisions, especially all these Spider-Men's original choice to be superheroes, feel a little superfluous. Like, they are who they are because reality demands demanded it. Or do you become intertwined with the great web at the moment you decide to take on any kind of spider motif? And yet, as I said, it's too much fun not to like it. It has that same energy and deliberate pacing I admired about Spider Island, and I can read Slot's enthusiasm for this insane concept dripping off the panels. Sometimes a little too much. It's hard to take the story seriously sometimes with all the overly jokey narration boxes establishing scenes. I know the whole thing's ultra goofy, but the backup feature gets pretty twisted 
twisted and creepy. Within the context of the zaniness, I don't want to feel like I'm reading something that's just a parody of itself, because it clearly wants to be a legitimate, well-told story, and Slot can get a little liberal with the editor's notes. For me, the big selling point is that this is essentially a what-if reunion. We've got all these Spider-Men I've seen before from other dimensions, from Noir to Spider-Ham to what if Peter Parker kept his six arms, and the new ones all seem like interesting creations as well. There's a lot about it I don't like when we're talking about the greater Marvel canon, but I can't help but enjoy any story that's this much fun on every page. Number... Three, Superman Unchained number nine by Scott Snyder and Jim Lee. It's going to be really interesting reading this whole series in one sitting and seeing how cohesive the thing holds together as one piece. I imagine I'll like it a lot more and pick up on a lot more of what Snyder's doing with all this thematic stuff about what freedom really is and what Superman really stands for when I digest it as a single piece. I've gone from not understanding what all the hubbub was about, thinking this should have just been an arc of one of the main books rather than a big standalone maxi series, to really appreciating the eventual ambition and grandness that's shining through. Through. This is Snyder deconstructing Superman for a contemporary world. Who is the man versus the shining example of humanity at its best that Superman is supposed to be? Does he really embody that, or is he just making it up as he goes along? Does he have too much power, and can anyone ever really trust him? And I've heard all this before, sure, but especially with this final issue, Snyder examines all this from a fresh perspective and introduces some ideas I hadn't really considered. Two words sum up why the final issue of Superman Unchained is on this list, and that is Lex Luthor. Lex comes to the maybe cynical conclusion that he and Superman are more alike than he ever imagined, that Superman really is just a man taking it one day at a time and is as imperfect as everyone else. And as I watched Lex find newfound respect for Superman, and couldn't decide if this was the most optimistic or most pessimistic thing I had ever read in a Superman comic, I found the whole examination of the two men's worldviews endlessly fascinating. It does unfortunately feel a little truncated, as I kind of expected, given that it was announced a while back that this was ending, I think, three issues short from what it was initially solicited as. Lee's art is dynamic and thrilling as you'd expect, and I like the simplicity and almost abstract nature of the Smallville flashbacks. It's like looking Looking at the past through the real dark and muddied lens of memory to a time that's painful to remember. I would like to know what the heck Batman is wearing. It looks like one of those preposterous action figures with a ridiculous color scheme and motif just to beef up a line. I wouldn't recommend the very last issue without the rest of it, of course, and while I don't think this is Snyder's very best work, it's one of, I think, the better Superman stories in 52 so far, and I would recommend it when it comes out in trade. Number 2 Tooth and Claw number one by Kurt Busick and Benjamin Dewey. Kurt Busick and Benjamin Dewey expertly realize an original and imaginative world of anthropomorphized characters in a bold fantasy that has the makings of a modern classic. It's a society of every manner of animal, frogs, bears, snakes, you name it, trying to live together peacefully, ruled by a government marred in bureaucracy. This is a vibrant, ornate, enlightenment-esque culture that relies on magic the way ours relies on technology. And although it's become clear to everyone, to the point where no one can deny that magic is fading away, this isn't Krypton all over again, the city's council won't allow Garda, a headstrong warthog, to go forward with her radical plan to return magic to the people, because the council sees it as sacrilegious. She naturally goes through with it anyway, and pays an enormous price. From the start, this 48-page introduction wastes no time, running the cultural gambit of politics and religion and the philosophical pantheon of fate versus free will and how much human sacrifice, or in this case, sentient animal sacrifice, is the greater good worth. The whole thing is as dead serious as Animal Farm. These aren't Disney animals, and it's not a cute book. Although I'm not sure yet why there is a mature reader's label on it. The ideas are heavy, and there are moral consequences here, but so far, this book reads perfectly appropriate for 12, maybe even 10-year-olds. I hope it's not just because Image thinks the language is too far over kids' heads. Music uses the animal species to reflect his character's personalities and motivations, as other stories of this kind have done before. The wise owl, the skittish frog, the blunt and fearless eagle. But the look and mythology of the piece instantly separates it from Redwall or Wind in the Willows, though I'm sure those were influences. I found the first several pages slow going, but once Garda is introduced and the main conflict 
is presented, it became a page turner. It's not immediately my cup of tea, but the questions of ethics and the social politics made me want to read on. I'll wait to finish this one in trade, but I highly recommend this first issue to anyone who loves complex fantasy worlds and likes to ponder the bigger questions while reading a comic book. And number one... Deadpool's Art of War 1 and 2 by Peter David, with art by Scott Koblish. This thing is everything I might have hoped for, but wouldn't really have expected from the title. It's Deadpool applying Sun Tzu's military philosophy to war in the Marvel Universe. I kind of expected only a loose connection to the original work. Nope, this is the Art of War adapted to a Deadpool comic, and it's as thought-provoking as it is hysterical. Man, do I love smart comedy, and Peter David is at his best here, clearly having the time of his life marrying the two most unlikely things I could think of and pulling it off masterfully. How can a comic that opens with Deadpool in the past, with no explanation as to how he's traveling through time by the way, killing Sun Tzu and deciding to try to capitalize on his intellectual property, manage to demonstrate such a deep understanding of Sun Tzu's philosophy? If I wanted to teach a group of high school kids about Sun Tzu's ideas in practice, I'd hand them this book. In the first two issues, it competently illustrates a number of his tenets of effective warfare. Always deceive your opponent, condition your soldiers to follow orders unwaveringly, short campaigns are more likely to succeed than long ones, using an incredibly outlandish premise. Deadpool wants to publish his own art of war, but the publisher he goes to says he needs his own spin, because Sun Tzu's philosophy has already been reprinted countless times and in countless ways. So Deadpool decides to write a book that applies the art of war to survival, kind of like the zombie survival guide. So what does he need? Well, his own apocalypse. So he decides in order to make his book viable, he has to create a world that is at war. So he pits Loki and Thor against each other, knowing that every time Asgard goes to war, Earth gets stuck in the middle. And man does David get comedy mileage out of Deadpool misunderstanding the Asgardians' tendency to say I, A-Y-E. As the best fourth wall breaking Deadpool stories are, this one is a satire of the Marvel editorial process, a comic that pokes fun of the comic medium from the inside, and is, in my mind, sort of the spiritual successor of Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe. Scott Kobush's art is a great throwback to ancient Japanese paintings and looks like a cross between Walt Simonson and Matthias Santaluco. It's one of the most creative and well-conceived mashups I've read in a long while. And now a couple of comics I just wasn't feeling this week. Green Arrow number 36. Arrow is a reimagining of Green Arrow. And now comic book Green Arrow is a reimagining of Arrow. Okay, I get it. Arrow is pretty popular. I like it a lot, too. And I don't mind incorporating some elements or characters like Lemire did with John Diggle into this version. But can't we keep the two separate in some way. In his first two issues, Kreisberg is very predictably and, I think self-indulgently, trying to force Lemire's Green Arrow into a TV set, and it's just not working for me. It's plotted like Arrow, it's written like Arrow, and pretty quickly, the whole main cast is being reworked so that all the main players are Arrow characters, including the big villain reveal at the end of this issue. I rolled my eyes at Felicity at the end of last issue, but at least it looked like she might serve a different role. It looked like she was the bad guy. Nope, not really, and she acts and talks almost identically to the character in the show. Maybe I wouldn't mind so much if this hadn't come off such a stunningly beautiful run with such a rich mythology, but by comparison, this reads like a cheap cash-in on the show's success, and I'd be real surprised if it paid off. Lemire's run was popular because more people were interested in learning about comic book Green Arrow having watched the show and word was getting around that it was good. This isn't going to sell just because three seasons in, TV show fans hear that the comic is basically exactly the same thing, especially since Arrow has already had its own comic from time to time. I'll give Daniel Sempier props though for using arrows to create a whole pages panel layout. That's pretty cool. And Life After Logan number one. Speaking of cash-ins, this is a pointless $5 collection of short stories depicting various X-Men characters grieving Wolverine's death in almost the exact same way. They each do something a lot like Wolverine would in order to honor his memory, like beating up a bunch of guys in a bar. And the best I am at what I do line shows up in all three of them. It's like all three writers were given outlines of the same sketch because these really aren't stories so much as snapshots, and a different set of characters, or else everybody had the same idea and nobody compared notes. 
I don't mind exploring what people's lives are like without Wolverine. World Without Superman was some of my favorite stuff during the Death of Superman era. But be a little more creative. These read like cute anecdotes, and they're just kind of exactly what you'd expect. And that concludes this week's Comic Book Top 5 Countdown. I want to say thanks as always to Elite Comics in Overland Park, Kansas for helping me out with the show. Uh, they make a lot of this possible, so very super cool of them. And if you're ever in the Kansas City area, check them out. They are an absolutely fantastic four. Uh, fantastic four. They're fantastic four. They're the fantastic for. No, they are an absolutely fantastic store. William does a lot for us. We really appreciate him. And if you want to uh, donate anything to see on the uh, reviewed on the Comic Vault, anything you'd like to see me put on the big wheel, you can always send things to our P.O. Box. That's Geekvolution, P.O. Box 4733, Overland Park, Kansas 66204. And feel free, as always, to leave ideas and suggestions for things to put on the big wheel to be spun on regular episodes of the Comic Vault. Look forward soon for another one of those. And in the meantime, I'm Captain Logan. And, and happy reading.